this is the vintage Sears Hearthside Widget Header Loom. And it was manufactured sometime in the 1940s. There's not a great deal of information left on this room, but from what I can gather, I think there's an article on the University of Arizona's website. They also manufactured floor looms. There's a four shaft and a six shaft heart side loom that are um, folding floor looms. So this one right here is the 27 inch rigid heddle one. So if you do come across the heart side name, um, there are other products that fall underneath that heart side name. Um, but when it comes to the looms, you're, you'll see the 27 inch rigid heddle one and the two um, floor looms. Now, it's my understanding from what I could gather from the research that the Floor looms are more commonly found than the rigid heddle ones. And like I said, the article didn't really give a range under which these guys were uh, produced. So I'm not sure how many of them were made or how long they were made, but not very long. Because in the early 50s, the floor shaft ones came out. And I think it might have been earlier than that, but somewhere between 1942 and like the 50s. You know the floor looms were available so this might have had a really short run and i've only seen a few of them on pinterest uh, i'm really grateful to have this loom um, my friend linda who is linda spins and weaves on ravelry found this at an estate sale and um, gifted it to me for a very nominal fee not even close to what this thing is worth and basically, this is my largest rigid head of loom um, that I have. And, of course, the main reason why I love it, besides the fact that it is vintage, um, and it, when you say vintage and antique, I'm like all over it. You know, the um, the floor loom I have, um, the Harrisville, I mean, that one was made in the 70s or 80s. So, you know, I just, I like it. I mean, with this one being made in the 40s, that's even cooler. And let me see if I can turn it. And there's just a little bit of the original sticker left on it. I can't really, in the position I'm at, you can't really see it as well. But the heart side, heart side sticker is still on the side. And it came warped with a multicolor uh, Maysville carpet warp. And I'm, I'm thinking that that's the original warp because when, when they were sold, they were marketed, sorry about the bouncing. One part of the tripod is on the soft part of uh, the couch here. Anyway, when they were marketed, they were marketed as being already pre-warped when they were sold. So it's really possible that that warp that I got on it originally was the actual original warp from the 40s, which is kind of scary. Um, it was a multicolor Maysville carpet warp. And it was already warped and it was my first time around. So I just used it and I, I really, I actually did use it. It helped with finding the detention and I made a rag rug. And if I can find pictures of that, I will uh, put pictures of that on there. But yeah, so that was strange and cool. And yes, I, I did use it. At any rate, um, see now I can't remember if I said this already, but one of the main reasons why I... I'm really thrilled about this loom is that it is built to make rugs. And when I first got the rigid heddle loom, um, the easy weave, which I gave to a friend and I never really picked up again. So I'm not really worried about that one. When I first got it, I really wanted to make rugs. And that little guy was my intro to weaving on a, loom with a heddle you know we all made those pot holder looms or finger wove when we were in school that was my first like heddle loom but of course that one really didn't have the kind of tension that you needed in order to make a rug and although you know people will say they can make rugs on rigid heddle looms and you can 
with some modification and some changes. It's not an impossible thing to do depending on what kind of rug you're making. A lot of them, modern ones, are not really built with the type of tensioning, strong tensioning you need to make rugs. Now, I have a floor loom, but my hair spill is very lightweight and it's not built for the kind of tensioning um, that is needed and the kind of beating that is needed in order to pack a rug. And it's 22 inches. So this rigid head of loom is built with the purpose of rum, rug making. Um, you can see the ratchet and paw down here. Look at this heavy wood. Let me slide in so you can see this really. Oh, that's like really big. Okay, so look at that heavy, heavy duty, you know. And there's another one on the back end. It's all very heavy wood, very heavy uh, teeth system here. Very thick cloth beams. Okay. It's, it's built in order to have the type of tensioning and then be able to take the kind of beating that you would need for rugs. So right now I have a rug rug, of course, on it. And um, I had lots of sheets that weren't necessary. And of course, instead of throwing them away, I decided to make a great rag rug. They're just some random colors of whatever I had. And I just went ahead and got started. I had some brown warp left over from, um, you know, I don't even know what I was doing with that brown warp. What was I making? Um, probably uh, bands, band weaving. And some white. I don't, because I don't use a lot of cotton, I don't buy it in multiple colors. I did just for that band weaving for a while. And I thought I would make some... Um, mats but I never got around to it some placemats I never really got around to it so I decided to use that up and I bought some more but most of it's just going to be white and so the plan was to make a few of these rag rugs and then use the white that I bought in order to make a few wool rugs because I just I mean I'm hand spinning so, of course, I want to weave with hand spun yarn. And why not make some wool rugs with some of the you know, really coarse wool that I have. I have churro. I have dorset. I have plenty of Cheviot and Suffolk and, you know, stuff like that. That don't make great um, wool rugs just for the fun. And I really wanted to do the uh, a little bit of the historical... Uh, Lindsay Woolley or Jersey Woolley. So I figured that was a good idea to try that out. And so at any rate, when I'm finished with this, then I'll put some hand spun on for a wool rug. And I, when I first put this on, I was just thinking big blocks of color. And you know, I don't even remember exactly how much warp I put on this thing. Now I'm thinking I wish I had kind of did like a, a different pattern. So I don't know. Maybe I'll make a second one and, you know, try to get more creative with the patterns. But right now I'm just really exploring, you know, this loom and pretty much rag rugs in general until I really get the feel. You know, there's some spaces here where they, they joined and I'm kind of work on how to, to join the two pieces better. And if you could sew the ends. I've seen lots of, of uh, preparation videos where they sew the ends together. Um, where you cut them in a certain way and can kind of get a continuous uh, weft. Uh, there's ways to put a knot in them and tie them, slip them into each other and get a continuous weft. But let's be honest, I was kind of lazy for that. I really didn't want to sit and sew all these things. And I really don't know um, how long or how many I need. I just cut them up. And I'm kind of feeling my way through this. 
and I don't even know what I'm going to do with this when I'm done with it because there's just there's a lot of things I make just for the sake of experimentation I don't actually use so this may never even get used it's not like I'm selling them or making them for a particular purpose so I wasn't quite willing to do that after I finish this and take this off the loom and have a good look at it if I want to invest more creative time in making more of them I might actually uh, take more preparatory steps in order to secure the warp. Uh, in the time that it took me to put together the video for the spinoff mitts, I actually completed the rag rug and this is basically what it looks like. It's just that I, these were the sheets that I had and um, I wanted to do the rag rug. So this is how it turns out. I, I haven't washed it yet. so. That still remains to be done, but it's all tied off. And there's a few areas where I need to tack, where I did not uh, overlap very well. Uh, and you know what, now that I think about it, I was so bent on not having it lumpy that I probably left too small of a space, or overlapped too small of a space. Probably should have overlapped at least three or four more inches. And that would have got me under here uh, you know, there's other ways to do it. You could tie the knots. You could actually sew the strips. But I really wasn't going through all that trouble to sew the strips on this particular rag rug. Because it's not like I'm selling a thing. And honestly, I don't really need a rag rug. I'm not going to lay it down anywhere in the house. So it just was kind of for weaving sake. Uh, if I was selling this or if I were using rag rugs all over the house, then I probably would would sew the strips. I don't know. I still might not sew the strips. Uh, that's still, that's a lot of work. There's a lot of strips. Okay. So anyway, and this was like really, really long and for life me, I'm like, why did I make this thing so long? Um, it's at least seven or, or eight feet long. Uh, it's probably, well, I just think it's more than six feet, probably two and a half yards, um, for this. And I warped this loom pretty much almost last year and hadn't got around to really doing anything with it. So I honestly cannot say what I was thinking because I didn't mark this one down in my book because it was just a rag rug. It wasn't like a full loom project that I really had well thought out. I just wanted to get familiar with that rag, uh, that rug loom and make another rag rug. So I, I'm not really sure what I was thinking when I made this, why I made this so long. It might have been that I had planned to put a spacer between it and uh, make two rugs. I don't know, but it's long enough to be a bed pad. It's long enough to be an exercise mat. It's long enough to um, go across the back seat of my truck. Uh, <laughs> it's it's a nice size, but I'm going to go ahead and like, like I said, I'm going to tack down uh, some of these overlapping spaces and some of them I just need to cut the flat piece like this one's jagged and so I, I laid it so that I could come by later and trim that across over there okay watching the studio blogs you probably discovered that I'm a big time paper crafter too I've got the Cricut and stamps and the Sizzix big shot and pretty much the whole nine yards of paper crafting I, I didn't want to start a separate channel for my paper crafting because when you have all those different channels, everything kind of gets, um, it's complicated. You know, it's not like this is my full-time job. So can you imagine um, how much time it would take if I had like a different channel for every craft I was doing? Oh boy. Okay. So at any rate, that's right. I'm doing the studio blocks and I can tell you everything I'm doing. And for those who are just looking for the fiber arts, you know, they don't have to really be bothered with all this other stuff. So, anyway, like a little disclaimer. And I forgot to turn off my notifications on the phone. Sorry about that. At any rate, I've been doing these paper crafts for a very long time. Um, I've been doing them since, like, elementary school when I used to help my mother make banners by hand for our church. And then um, when the whole computer thing got big, and yes, I'm old enough to remember the Tandy computers with the turtle and the dot matrix printers, um, we used the print shop programs and I made cards then. 
all the way up into high school with the Apple II GSs and the print shop again and Adobe Page Mill and made the cards and then um, into college and high school with print shop again, which is always one of my favorite programs. Um, I made digital cards and programs for church. Uh, several years ago, um, I got into making the cards by hand and that became because I did a scrapbook for college. And so I had those kind of scrapbook things and I was watching a, a lady um, named May May with her cricket. And I had seen a friend with the cricket um, at school. I'm familiar with the Sizzix machines because the Ellison machine that teachers use to stamp out letters, basically um, Sizzix owns Ellison. And uh, so I've always been familiar with the die cutting machine. I didn't realize they made a small one because I always wanted an Ellison machine and they are very expensive. And then I realized that Sizzix makes a small personal one for paper crafters. And that's why I got my Cricut and my Sizzix and was watching May May and learned about making cards by hand in this, this fashion. So after that, I've been a big handmade card person and I've been trying to find ways to kind of share that on my YouTube channel. I've made a few separate videos. Uh, they're okay. I'm still working on that aspect, but putting in a studio vlog is pretty much the best way to go here. Okay. So let me show you what I'm doing. I've got two things going on and this is the cards I'm making these are this is hmm, the card I'm making uh, I wanted to really hone my card skills but besides a few birthdays from my nieces and nephews and there's only like four of them um, and uh, you know, a birthday or two here and there for someone in the church, there wasn't a lot of opportunity for make it, me to make a great deal of cards. And if there's one thing about making something, you really have to make a lot of something in order to perfect your skills and get a mastery at it. So spinning one or two skein of yarns a month, well, I guess it depends on how big your skeins are, and maybe using your yarn once every so often is not really gonna help you perfect the craft. You have to spin a lot of yarn. You have to spend a lot of different fibers. Same thing with paper crafting. You have to make a lot of cards and to try a lot of different techniques in order to really build up your skills. So I'm making all these cards and they have to go somewhere because I just got like a box of cards and I don't know about you, but I feel like if I'm making things and I'm just tossing them in the bags, it just doesn't really bring me that kind of joy. It has to be useful. So what I decided to do was collect a couple of my friends from Facebook and say, hey, you all, I want you to help me hone my card making skills. All you have to do is give me your address and I will send you cards. Bam, it's so easy. So I got about 12 friends, which is perfect because that's about good for, you know, postage and card making. And I've been sending them cards every couple of months in the seasons. So I did um, an introductory card of course, they got a Christmas or a Hanukkah or holiday card. And it's time for spring. It's time for another round of cards. So I have this stamp. Uh, I want to say that this is the Stampin' Up! one. You know, I have two telephone stamps. Oh, no, I think the Text You Later one is the Stampin' Up! one, where it's the square phone. Okay, so this is another one. And uh, it's just the coolest little thing with the, the bubble, with the text and everything in there. But I think I'm gonna insert maybe a picture. So I haven't decided, but each person is gonna get a slightly different personalized phone. So that's where I am now. I'll, I'll color it or stamp it onto a different color and you know, dress it up a little bit. So you'll see that soon and put that card together. And I'll discuss how I like to layer my cards and maybe a little card procedure. And then second, I've been doing these cards. I have been a big time calligraphy fan for ages. And I actually did a lot more calligraphy in middle school and high school uh, than I've done in the past couple of years. And I've always been saying I'm going to get back into uh, hand lettering. I have a somewhere a gigantic spiral bound book of hand lettering. It is the coolest book. Um, but I've, you know, it's, it's just... Um, well, it is what it is. If you've ever done any calligraphy, fountain pens, all that kind of stuff, 
they can be expensive. Calligraphy can be expensive um, to start up, but it can also be inexpensive. So I went to Michael's and found a dip pen. And this is from the Speedball Company. Speedball is also a company that makes the paint for screen printing that I do. And this is a cool little guy, but I have to be so careful with it because it's got like, uh, that'll focus. It's got like the most sensitive little nub and I could just drop it on the floor and crack this poor thing all up. And it came with the little basic dip pen nub and with um, a little jar of ink. And this right here is the, I want to make sure I say it right. I probably won't. I'll have a link. It's the Cheaters Illuminated Alphabet, roughly. Um, it's on Lindsay's website from the Postman's Knock. And what you do is, oh, it's just called Cheater for a reason. You print out the alphabet. And it's just big enough for A2 size cards, which I really love because they're economical and they give you just enough room to play with. You hold it up to the light. And what I did was, this is watercolor paper. As you can see, this is my watercolor uh, spot down here. This is from Sandy Allnock, by the way. But anyway, hold it up to the light, lay this on the back, and I actually... Um, Put my cell phone back there. It gave me really good light. And then trace this onto the watercolor paper in um, pencil. And Lindsay recommends handmade uh, paper, but I didn't have any on hand. I just had watercolor paper, now, which is really cool. And that's one of the reasons why it's called the Cheetos Illuminated because you're, you're tracing it on there. Uh, as I get better and better, I could actually hand draw this on here, but this was quick and dirty method. Uh, then after that, what I did was I used gold acrylic paint. Uh, Lindsay uses gold watercolor paint, but I couldn't find any at Michael's. Um, not the brands that were recommended or the brands that Sandy Allnock recommends. And uh, gold watercolor paint isn't exactly cheap. Uh, gold acrylic paint is very cheap. So, and since I'm only using it for this, it'd be different if I was going to um, paint all the time. I think it's called quinacre then, gold. If I was going to paint all the time with gold watercolor paint, I probably still would have bought it. But it's kind of rare that I use any gold paint. So I feel like, figured the acrylic would be okay. And actually acrylic turned out really well. And then of course, uh, after you do that, and then you, she did a watercolor on the outside with the purple. And then you trace the lines with the pen and the ink. And as you can see, they're not very straight or very smooth. Uh, part of that is because of the texture. I wish I'd used the other side of the watercolor paper, but this is a rough texture watercolor paper. So I had a lot of dips that I was hitting and pulling up cotton inside of my nib, which she warned against about some handmade papers. So I did run into that problem with the watercolor paper, but all in all, it turned out very nicely. I'm very pleased. This is the second one I did. I did one for my grandmother um, for her birthday. And this one is uh, for me. I'm gonna do one for my mother. It turned out really well. So if you're interested in getting into a little calligraphy for whatever reason, um, Lindsay at the Postman's Knock has these really nice tutorials and has some really um, nice freebies to help you get into the calligraphy. Okay, so you've seen more of that. All right, I am done. I feel like I just downloaded a ton of information. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, when you speak been a lot of time, you know, kind of doing something else. And then you come back to the video, you realize you, you actually, um, a lot of has gone on in between the time of videos. And so it seemed like a whole lot. Okay. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead, uh, finish those leggings so that I can go ahead and start the video for the 
um, mid-along, before mid-along is over. And hopefully by then I will have got myself together because I have lots of projects planned. I still need to do the um, long draw video for the Spinner's Book of Yarn Design. And I do have yarn ready for weaving with hand spun. I need to go ahead and warp that loom. So hopefully I'll have something else in the next couple of weeks. Thank you for weeks. those who have subscribed. And if you have any comments or questions or anything you'd like to hear me talk about or see me do, please let me know um, in the comments. I don't make as many videos as I'd like to a lot of times because I'm just not really sure uh, what people are looking for. So um, send me your ideas and I'd be more than happy to make a video on it. I right, thank you. Have a great day.